John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I might say, ask how how he how he could say he saw the glory of the only begotten Son um, in the rest of the book is going to show us how he saw this glory. We have an indication in. Luke chapter 2, in verse 11, at the marriage of Cana at Cana, uh, where he changes the water into wine. In verse 11, John says, This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. And the disciples believed in him. This is uh, the works of Christ manifested his glory. His glory is, uh, glory would be here manifested glory, not essential glory. <clears throat> they saw uh, his glory, his divine glory, as it was manifested to them. Uh, in his in his works, um, the glory of God uh, for humans is always mediated, and I believe through the logos, through the word. But this is you'll notice that he said we beheld his glory. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten, or the monogenes. Maybe your version has something like one and only or unique son of the Father. I still like the old translation, only begotten. I still believe there is a, uh, a relationship to, uh, although distant, to genao there. Uh, this is the concept of the ancient fathers saw in this word, only begotten. I think that's right. But this is the glory that belongs to him because he's the only begotten of the Father. And it belong he is the only begotten of the Father because he is the word. The logos became flesh. And we beheld his glory. Whose glory? The glory of the logos. And what glory is that? The glory that belongs to the only begotten of the Father. To be the Word here in this, in this verse is to be the only begotten of the Father and therefore have divine glory. And that indicates to me that, that his, uh, his sonship is not something that begins with his incarnation. It is his eternally as the Logos. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was already being. And when you put this with verse 14, I would say not only was he already, was the Word already beginning, but the only begotten of the Father was already in existence. He is the eternal Lagos. He is the eternal word of the Father. And as such, he has divine glory. And he has that eternally. 
When it says we beheld his glory, he does not mean that we saw into the essential divine glory. We saw it as we see in chapter 2. We saw it manifested. It's manifested glory. But nevertheless, it is, it is eternally his. It is eternally connected with him uh, as the only son of the father. As the only one who is the eternal son of the father. This is important because uh, there, there is an identification of him as having a relationship of son to father. And that relationship is in the context of his uh, being divine. He is divine. He has divine glory. And this glory is, is eternal. This is a passage that's, that's worth meditating on. It's to remind us that whatever this incarnate one is, he is with respect to his deity, the Son of the Father. And that is prior to his incarnation. We have access to the Son. We are united with him, and we have access to his glory through the word of God. Our access to the glory of God is through the word of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says that the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Verse 6, he says, It is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It is through him that we have access to glory through the gospel. It is the word that is, it is the word of God that is, the medi is our medium, is the medium for us to see the manifested glory of, of the Son of God. We give thanks today for this. I have another note. Uh, speaking of giving thanks, I want to uh, take this opportunity to wish you and your, your loved ones a blessed Thanksgiving season and uh, trust your celebration will be sweet with your loved ones. Um, I think that you know, there are a number of Christian virtues that are very, uh, very appealing, but they are, they are very difficult to practice, and thanksgiving is one of them. Um, this is the problem of fallen man in Romans 1, that he was not thankful. And so to be, to be a Christian is to be thankful. We need to practice the virtue of thanksgiving. We have so much in our lives for which to be thankful. It is difficult uh, when you're, you know, when you're going toward a goal like you are in your education, and there's so many pressures and everything upon you to stop and give thanks for the pressures. Uh, because that means that you are involved in something significant, worthwhile, and of eternal consequence. And these pressures are actually signs that you are involved in this and that this is of God. And uh, so give thanks even for the difficulties. The difficulties are there because God has a special calling in your life. He has a special thing for you to do. Give thanks for this. 
give thanks for uh, for uh, your position in Christ. I, I'm reminded that uh, Jesus told his disciples, "Don't thank, give thanks because don't rejoice because the the devils are made subject to you. Uh, rejoice because your names are written in heaven." There are things that are more important than the power of the ministry, and that is just to be able to to be in fellowship with the true and the living God. And give thanks uh, for all the provisions that God has made for you and your family. Give thanks for this school, uh, for the Master's Seminary. Do not take it for granted. Uh, Believe me, I don't. don't ever think it'll always be there. Uh, I can still remember uh, students uh, down through the years at Capital Bible Seminary saying, "Oh, I can always take that next next semester." You know, I, I always pause now when I hear that. I can always take, pick that up next semester. Uh, and uh, there came a time when they couldn't. And so give thanks for your seminary. Uh, It's a seminary that holds to the word of God. It's a seminary uh, whose uh, professors are interested in you, who are investing in you. That is not true with every seminary in the world. And so uh, I just uh, came from a uh, prayer meeting at uh, uh, faculty has a prayer meeting while you're having your uh, ASB Chapel, and uh, the tremendous interest that our faculty has in in you and in the, uh, the alumni of this school. Uh, it is something, it, always remember that the faculty is for you. The faculty is not against you. It is for you. And what uh, they, they have, we all have uh, a vested interest in what's bec- what becomes of you in the ministry. So give thanks for school with faculty that are committed to you personally and your development in the ministry. There are a lot of things to give thanks for at this time of the year. And so uh, let us then go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on this time as we give thanks that we have have been made one with the Son of God and through his word have uh, come to uh, to be have his the light of his glory shine on us. Our Father, we thank you for your kindness to us in Christ Jesus. We thank you for salvation in him that our names are are written in the Lamb's book of life. We thank you for for this uh, seminary and for all that it stands for, for all those down through the years who have, who have sacrificed, who have, uh, who have given not just uh, faculty and students, uh, but uh, staff, um, uh, board, uh, uh, faithful donors down through the years, all the people who have stood with this school down through the years, We thank you for our president, for Dr. MacArthur, all the sacrifices that he made in his life uh, to to be used of you in this kind of ministry. We pray your blessing on this time as we continue to talk about uh, your triunity, and we ask that you might encourage us, uh, give us uh, great gratitude in our hearts, especially in this Thanksgiving time uh, that... uh, More than blessings that we have in this land, uh, we have the blessing of salvation and fellowship with the God of heaven. We pray your blessing uh, on us as we contemplate these matters now and throughout this special Thanksgiving season. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Last time we had left off in Lesson 32 and wanted to talk about, continue to talk about the Trinity and especially wanted to talk today about the uh, 
eternal sonship of the Son of God, the uh, notice that the second person is eternally the Son of God, and we put pointed this out in John three sixteen. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The point here is that he is already the son as he is sent into the world. And I don't have John 1.14 down there, but I would add that, that he has the glory that belongs to the only begotten son. And this is divine glory. Uh, it is not glory that begins with his uh, with his taking on humanity, rather it is it is his because uh, he is the Logos and uh, the eternal Son of God. First John uh, four verses nine and ten, same concept, a uh, little bit a little bit uh, stronger wording there. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. He is sent into the world as the Son of God. He, is, he does not become the Son of God when he arrives in the world. He is already the Son and is sent forth. Romans 8, 3, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He sends his Son To be the only begotten Son of God is to be deity. So if you are the Son of God, you have to be so eternally. Uh, John 1.14, we read that uh, in our devotional. This is, second person is the only begotten before his incarnation. Uh, I take John 1.18, not to be the only begotten God, but the only begotten Son. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. This present, uh, present participle here, ha'on, uh, indicating to me this is an ever, uh, this is a continuing state for the monogenes huios. He has exegeted the Father. The only begotten Son eternally exists in the bosom of the Father. The uh, second person is the only begotten before his incarnation. Talked about this. Um, and I mentioned that you could add John 1.14 to that as well. And then a word on only begotten. Uh, in normal human usage, Monogenes is used of an only child born as part of a family through his existence. This is not used of an adopted child, but rather one who is uh, in the in the child in the family as uh, throughout his existence. Uh, Luke, <clears throat> Luke seven eight nine Hebrews eleven. Uh, these are uh, human usages of monogenes. And since the term is used in the second person, uh, the second person is generated. Now I'm going to suggest by eternal generation that what should be seen, regardless of what theologians in the past may have seen in this, should not be an ontological production, but rather this is, he is the, uh, shall we say, he's the only generated son of the father. That is not an ontological production, and we'll talk about that presently. 
but rather that this is a generation in terms of an establishment of a relationship, an eternal establishment of relationship. So eternally, he exists in this relationship, that this is an eternal assertion of his relationship as son to father. Now, we talked about Psalm 2-7 last time in our devotional. Uh, this is, I see Psalm 2 as a, a prophecy that is uh, uh, fulfilled beginning at the resurrection slash ascension slash seating of Jesus at the right hand of the Father. This is when the decree is made to the cosmos before the cosmos Jesus, to Jesus, he says, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Now that was not the uh, beginning of his existence as the only begotten son of God. It is not the beginning of his existence as the unique son of God, but rather it is a formal investiture in public. It's a public presentation of him as in, some, in an official way before the, before the creation as the, as the Son of God. You are my Son. Today I have begotten you. And I do believe that uh, Psalm 2-7 uh, uh, is first and foremost concerning an economic uh, uh, recognition and uh, investiture uh, and, and enthronement uh, in time, in time, at the, uh, at the ascension, at the seating of the right hand. The term Son of God has divine, eternal application to the second person. He did not become the Son of God at his ascension. This has divine, eternal application to him. And I think that is what is behind the uh, activities in time concerning the Son of God, the announcements of him, the pronouncements of him as the Son of God, as the only begotten Son of God. Uh, today, he is publicly, shall we say, begotten by his enthronement. This is recognition of something behind that. Behind the economic realities of the Trinity in time are the eternal realities of the Trinity. Now, this is a rule that was first observed, uh, uh, at least from what I can discern in the Church Fathers by Augustine, that the economic trinity reveals what is called the imminent trinity, or what I've referred to as the ontological trinity. Imminent trinity doesn't refer to God imminently uh, dwelling with us, but what he is in himself, as he is imminently with himself. And so the, the, uh, the maxim is usually stated, the economic trinity reveals the imminent trinity. What we have, what we see in, God, in the relationships between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in time is re uh, reveals something about what they are eternally to each other uh, in themselves or in the uh, community of the trinity. And we went through these passages in, he, in, in Acts 13, in Hebrews 1, Hebrews 5, to show that this, is, this, this decree is made when Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. And then, and then according to uh, uh, the prophecy of Psalm 2, he, he returns, and with this decree, he declares this decree as his right to rule, and he takes this decree, he declares the decree, and then he rules the nations with a rod of iron. And uh, that's picked up in Matthew, in Revelation 19 at the uh, uh, second advent of Christ. Uh, concerning uh, eternal generation, and I can put generation in quotation marks, although it is an eternal action, it is an eternal, I would say, a, an establishment of relationship of father and son. Uh, it certainly is not a creative act, and so it's, this is not an, a production of some sort. 
Now, it's interesting, when you, when you read church fathers, and this is where you have to be careful in reading church fathers, because they're starting from scratch. They're, they're wrestling with this whole thing about, well, uh, he's a son of the father. How does he become a son of the father? Irenaeus, the, uh, 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 Irenaeus of Lyon, who was, was born in Asia Minor, but uh, had his ministry actually in southern Gaul or southern France uh, in Lyon. Uh, he uh, said, you know, one time he used the word production of, of, the, of the sun. And so you have to really be careful about coming down too hard on these guys. They are just starting out. and They're, they're grasping for language somehow to, uh, at one point he says, or whatever you call it. Uh, so he's, he's, He's 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 at his wit's end. Okay, what do I call it? You know about, uh, and and so uh, and so we said, Amen, errant brother Irenaeus. Uh, we we'd like to know that too. Uh, um, but it certainly is not a creative act, or else God would not be God. Then we would be Arians. You know, there would be a time when he was not. So it's not an ontological production. Uh, it is a necessary act. He has to be eternally established as the Son of God. Uh, it's not a contingent act. He has to be eternally the Son, and he's the eternally the Son by common relationship, by agreement that this will be their relationship. This is, this is a personal decision that is of an eternal nature, that this will be their relationship. And if that is, if it is a contingent event, it's not eternal, and therefore uh, the Son is less than God. Uh, he is not eternally the Son, and therefore he's not eternal God. Uh, this is an eternal, unceasing act. Uh, if it is not an eternal act, it's not an intra-Trinitarian act. And therefore the Son is not the divine Son. He's something established in a sonship outside of deity, and John 1.14 then cannot apply to him. He cannot have glory that belongs only to the Son of God. To be the Son of God is to have this eternal glory. This glory belongs to only one, only somebody who has position to have this, this eternal glory. That cannot begin in time. It cannot begin with him in his incarnation. Now, when I say a generation, I, I uh, refer to this in the sense of an, the eternal assertion or establishment of the personal relationship of the Son, not ontological production. Now, you all went to, home to your wives Tuesday and you said that, right? Yeah. Some of, some of y'all came afterwards. What does it mean? <laughs> We're not ontologically producing the Son from the Father. The Father does not produce the Son, even in an eternal way. Now, that was Origen's original. That was his, the way he originally had it. Was that, but the problem with that is that makes the Son uh, ontologically inferior to the Father. He is de and also dependent. He's inferior because he's dependent on his ontology, on his being, on his essence. Uh, he's dependent on the Father for his essence. In this eternal act, this personal establishment, again, this is a personal intra-Trinitarian establishment of their relationship uh, by the Father and the Son. Uh, so that is what I'm, what I'm talking about. Uh, I've, I've been interested recently. Now, uh, I must say that, that, that I, I, I came to isolate this articulation uh, about uh, uh, almost 20 years ago um, now. Uh, but I see that, that other uh, uh, theologians are... are uh, uh, also articulating like this, and one would be Gerald Bray in his recent uh, systematic theology, God is Love, uh, which I would never, uh, uh, I don't think I'd, uh, I'd uh, entitle my systematic theology that, uh, but 
nevertheless, uh, it is, I mean, it's not a false statement. It's just, uh, I think it's uh, 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 sliding into a hierarchy of attributes there. But the the point is is that uh, you know he he does he does have this same co similar articulation about uh, the uh, uh, that this is a an agreement he calls it an eternal agreement between the father and the son uh, to be father and son to each other and again it's not a, a an agreement in time it's something that just is always there it's just they always are uh, are uh, relate to each other as father and son. And this is not something that's passive. It's not a relationship that's come upon them passively. They have actively committed to each other as father and son. And uh, uh, involved in this simple act is the eternal establishment of the relational communication of the father to the son, but not ontological production. What about the uh, eternal procession? Now, the, there are two parallel acts in the Trinity. One is called eternal generation. And this is generation not in the sense of ontological production. I have to keep guarding it with negative theology because our human minds run to, oh, generation, oh, oh. What a beautiful baby, you know. That's what. That's what uh, no, uh, that's not what we're thinking here. Uh, so that's why I sometimes put it in quotation marks. But it is a biblical term, mo monogenes, and I think uh, you know that behind the uh, official in time acts, like the seating of the Son at the right hand of the Father, is this eternal. Uh, Agreement, assertion, uh, establishment, whatever you want to, however you want to call it. Sound like Irenaeus, whatever you want to call it. Think so. um, what about a procession of the Spirit? Now, this is how the Spirit relates to the Father and the Son. And uh, support for the uh, procession, first of all, comes from the term ruach, the, uh, who, the Hebrew term ruach. Which and, and the Greek term pneuma, uh, through breath or wind. So this is has so, has is coming from somewhere, and there's movement. And then John 20, after his resurrection, Jesus breathes on the disciples, says, "Receive the Holy Spirit." And John 15:26 is really <clears throat> the central passage that down through the years, down through the centuries, has been used for procession of the Spirit. It's a pers uh, a present tense in John 15, 26, uh, from ek peruamai. He proceeds uh, from, the, uh, from, from the Father. Uh, when the Holy, when the, when, when, when the, uh, when the parakletos, when the comforter, the helper, uh, has come, uh, the, uh, the aorist, uh, whom I, ego, I, speaking of Jesus, pempso, will send to you from the Father. Um, so notice he's going to send to him from the Father, and here the Greek preposition para is used. Not out of the Father, but from the Father. So, Spirit's already existing, and the Son's going to send him from the like the from the side of the Father, the Spirit of Truth. And now he uses John uses again, or or at least is quoting Jesus as uh, in by using the. Um, uh, Greek preposition para again. Ha para to patros. Ek paruetai. Uh, the one uh, whom from the Father uh, proceeds. The one that is the Spirit who proceeds from the Father. Notice not ek, but para. He proceeds from the side. He had just used para. 
how the Son's going to send him from the Father. Now he's using it, the Spirit proceeds from the Father. And this is why this passage cannot be an ontological passage. Because he is just because of the double use of para, that he uses this as uh, the, the, the Spirit, whatever the Spirit is doing, he's doing it as already in existence and distinct from the Father. He is not coming out of the Father, he is coming from the Father. It's like if, if, if I were to say, I am sending uh, Brian from this uh, from me to, to Dr. Buzenitz with a message. Uh, help! No, uh, 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 it doesn't mean he's coming out of me. It means he's, he's already distinctly existing and I'm sending him and he's, he's with me and I'm sending him to somewhere else. And that's what was going on in John 15, 26. The double use of para, I think, is the key. This is not an ontological production. But this is the key passage for procession of the Spirit. And many have uh, uh, understood this, I think falsely so. I don't think this is the, the, this is the proper biblical doctrine of the procession of the Spirit, that he, many have seen this as, well, he's just like the Son is produced from the Father, so the Spirit is produced from the Father. Well, the ancient Arians held that. We don't hold that. The double use of para, the Son doesn't take the Spirit out of the Father. No, he doesn't do that. The Spirit's all existing and the Son sends him. And the Spirit proceeds from the side, like from the side of the Father. It's, it's, it's from being with the Father. Um... The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Son, Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And so uh, this could be either uh, probably genitives of source or association. In other words, that he belongs to the Son, he belongs to Christ. Uh, and Jesus said he would send the Holy Spirit, John 15, 26, para to Patras from the Father. Now, uh, let's clarify this again on the same lines as eternal generation. Again, this is not a creative, you could slip in, ontological act. It's not an act of ontological production. Or else the Spirit is not God. It is, again, a necessary act. This is not an option. These two have a relationship, or these three have a relationship between each other, and that's an eternal relationship. It must be that they agree that they, to have this. This is not a passive thing. Whatever the Trinity does, whatever God does, whatever these three persons do, they do actively, willingly. They do volitionally, and they relate to each other. And that's why I infer that this is, this is an act of establishment of relationship an eternal act. If it is contingent, then the Spirit is not eternally related as the Spirit of God. If it's contingent, then it, then it might happen or it might not happen, and therefore it becomes a temporal act, and therefore it is not something that can be eternal. Uh, it, it is an eternal unceasing act, if it's not an eternal act, it's not an intra-Trinitarian act because all their actions in, within, among themselves are eternal. Eternal. And therefore, the Spirit is not God. So what is the definition? Now, from the standpoint of the Father and the Son, this action is called spiration because of the Holy Spirit being, and, and, and the terms for Spirit being have to do with breath and wind, Procession from the standpoint of the Spirit. Here in John 15, 26, he proceeds from the Father in the sense of an eternal assertion or establishment of the personal relationship of the Spirit, not his essence. This is, again, establishment of personal relationship between the Father and Son on one side and Holy Spirit on the other. 
in this act, in this eternal act, the personal relationship is eternally asserted or established by the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And involved in this simple act is the eternal establishment of the relational communication of the Father and the Son to the Spirit and vice versa. And what this is going to mean for the Spirit is that eternally he is, he is committing to being the agent of the Father and the Son. That's, and he, that, that's his relationship to the Father and the Son. He is going to eternally do their bidding. He is going to eternally be their spirit, be their agent. And this is his eternal relationship to them. Incidentally, uh, both of these acts, both eternal generation, eternal uh, procession, uh, at least in my thinking, in, involves an eternal economic or relational subordination uh, of one to the other. And so there is such a thing as relational subordination, even though there is not ontological or essential subordination. They are never less than one another in their being. They are, there is, however, an order with respect to their relations. The Father, the Son, submits to the Father. And the Spirit submits to the Father and the Son. And so this, this, is, this is the order. Now, there is an issue I want to address. And again, uh, these are inferences about their eternal relationships based on how they relate to each other in time. Again, the economic trinity revealing something about the imminent trinity. But these are inferences. I think they're valid inferences based on what we're seeing in based on John 15, 26, which is an economic passage and has to do with things in time, I think we have, we have uh, uh, behind that how these three are related to each other in eternity. Yeah, Joe? So would that be consistent? Maybe this is too hypothetical, but would that be consistent um, outside of time? Would that would would what be out consistent? He's outside of time. Yeah. In other words, he's he's always this this relationship is always there, regardless of whether there's a a a, a, a creation or not. They are always they are eternally related this way. Yeah. And so, this is how they relate. And so these activities of generation and procession, I define these in terms of their relationship, not in terms of their ontology. Their ontolo in, in their ontology, they are equal. They, each of them possesses the full uh, divine essence. And so they are not, they are, they are, they, there's no pecking order ontologically. There is in relationship, though, in personal relationships. Um, would the word role work equally well there? Yeah, uh, you could you could say that yes, because role doesn't role as long as we don't keep role away from the matter the matter of essence or being. Role is how they act to each other, and that's that's their relationship to each other. That's why economic and and relational uh, very often are used interchangeably in in this these eternal relationships between them. Yeah. Now another another issue that's been down through the years is whether there the, the there is a the spirit proceeds only from the father or from the father and the son whether it's a double versus single procession and uh, this has gone down through the years uh, and the uh, difference has come down to uh, I want to summarize this uh, very quickly probably all too quickly. 
uh, a, a division between the Eastern and Western churches, between the Latin-speaking Western churches in, uh, in the uh, Roman Empire and the Greek-speaking Eastern churches in the Roman Empire. And of course, these, this, the, this disagreement has perpetuated then throughout the heirs of those churches in both uh, Western Europe and, and, uh, and, and the Americas and, and in Eastern uh, uh, Europe and, and, and then on into the Middle East and other uh, churches uh, that are Greek-speaking. Uh, Greek-speaking churches uh, tend to go with a single procession from the Father only, or they will accept from the Father through the Son, but the Father is always the high God. And it's because these two generally see a different construction of the Trinity. Easterners tend to see the Father as the high God and, all, and the other two coming from the Father. The uh, Western churches have, have generally seen the three persons as, as, uh, as eternally coming uh, uh, you know, as a result of their uh, shared essence. And so because they have these different pictures of the Trinity, they have a different picture of how the Spirit proceeds. Uh, and unfortunately, I think that uh, all too often in the history of the church, this, this matter of procession, like the matter of generation, was seen as a, an ontological production. And I'm trying to uh, have us away from that and uh, the uh, trend amongst those uh, theologians who deal with uh, eternal generation, eternal procession now, is to strongly establish that negative, that point of negative theology that this is not ontological production. Um, the Western Church added something to the Constantinopolitan Creed. In the Constantinopolitan Creed of 381, they said, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and life giver, who proceeds from the Father. Well, the West, at the Third Synod of Toledo, Spain, in 589, stuck in the Latin expression filioque, which means and the Son, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Well, the Eastern Church got their hackles up and said, you added something to the creed, you're heretics. And so this was part of the uh, ongoing uh, and growing uh, division between East and West in, in the church, ultimately leading to the final formal split between East and West. Um, but uh, both West and East agree to the wording uh, from the Father through the Son what the East will not accept is that the Son is also an, uh, a source along with the Father of the, of the, uh, of the uh, procession of the Spirit. Now, if you have a relational and economic view of the, uh, of the procession of the Spirit, as I do, this is not a problem because uh, this is a sending uh, the spirit becomes the emissary, uh, the uh, the ambassador, if you will, the the agent of the Father and the Son in John fifteen twenty six. And because you have a double use of para there in John fifteen twenty six, I think it argues that the Son is as much a source of the sending of the Spirit as is the as is the Father. Uh, and so the procession is, uh, comes from, uh, and, uh, to me, the, the, the procession must be from both because I see that, uh, and then again, that depends on your definition of procession slash aspiration or, and, and, and your concept of the way John 15, 26 sets up exegetically. Uh, again, Western Church, double procession, asserted by the Synod of Toledo, 8589, adding the uh, expression filio. That's why I wanted you to learn the Synod of Toledo in 589 as one of the other councils. This was not a, an ecumenical council. This was a synod, a local synod, that, uh, uh, whose findings stood, uh, came to stand for the Western churches. 
Uh, so I, I asked you to remember uh, Nicaea in 325 and Constantinople in 381 for, for the uh, relationship of the Father and the Son. And now the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, as those two established the Orthodox uh, dogma of the Trinity, Orthodox dogma of the Trinity, uh, the uh, double procession uh, was asserted by the Western churches in 589 at the Third Synod of Toledo. Um, I mentioned the word dogma, by the way, in case this hadn't run by you or you hadn't taken our History of Doctrine class with Professor Busnitz. Uh, you'll learn that dogma is a little bit different from doctrine. Dogma is a, a formal formally agreed upon doctrine. In other words, it's official doctrine. There are more doctrines in, say, like a church or a school than there are dogmas. Dogma, though, is what has been officially put down and formally recognized by and a, a, Christ, a, a Christian church or school or organization as their official doctrine. So like with respect to the master's seminary, the dogma would be found where? Pardon? Statement of faith, yes, a doctrinal statement. Uh, if, you're, if your church has a doctrinal statement, hope it does, uh, then that's your dogma. But there are a lot of other doctrines that are taught probably. And are, and are held by the people, uh, but are not officially put down by, uh, by, by a vote of the congregation or by the board in your official constitutional doctrines there. Yeah, go ahead, Alan. Same thing with the use of the word confession. Yes, yes, confession is dogma. Confession of, is dogma if it's been approved by some, some formal uh, ecclesiastical body, uh, so... Like Westminster Confession was approved in 1647 by the Westminster Assembly of the Church of England. Now, the Church of England no longer uh, does not hold that anymore. Of course, you know, Presbyterians controlled the Parliament at that time, and so that's why that's why it was it was uh, <laughs> it was agreed upon as the uh, as the dogma of the Church of England. Well, of course, then then the uh, 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 Puritans were uh, ultimately run out of town, and and uh, and and the uh, the Anglican Church reverted to its former dogma, which was the Thirty Nine Articles. Thirty Nine Articles is the dogma of the Anglican Church. Eastern Church sees a single procession because they see the Father alone as the cause. Use that term, cause. That's why I think a lot of this language has the apparent uh, has the appearance, at least, of of ontological production, and uh, down through the years, this has disappeared, especially in the West, and uh, we need to uh, further make this kind of language disappear. Now, if it is true that, uh, uh, that the economic trinity, how God is in his economic works in time, reveals who he is, to some, at least to some extent, who he is, in his, in his being and in his inner relationships as a trinity. This is the economic trinity revealing the imminent trinity. Well, God reveals himself in perfect unity in creation and redemption. Uh, in creation, all three are in action. All three work together. In redemption, all three work together. Uh, there's an economic order in the works of the Trinity. We talk about the economy of the Trinity, the economic Trinity. We're talking about the Trinity at work in time. Uh, the, and the economic order, the, the works of the Trinity reveal the ontological, relational, imminent Trinity. There's something about those works and how they are to each other in those works that reveals something about how they are eternally with each other. In the community of in the eternal community of the Trinity, and certain works are ascribed to one person, others ascribed to especially another. We've seen this already. No work 
can be ascribed exclusively to one over the other two. Uh, so when we see one ascribed to one, what's, what's my rule on that? Yeah, what, what, what's my dictum on that? Evidence is not exclusion. Oh, dictum. Oh, yeah. Evidence is not exclusion. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you must have that up in your mirror or something. But that's good. Uh, that saves you, you know, when you're at home and you say, when you, when you say something, you say, and your wife says, well, what about this? I say, oh, no, no, no. Emphasis, not exclusion. No, 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 no. Uh, which is just for the sake of, 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 of what I was talking about. It was emphasis, not, not exclusion here. So. Forget it. It's only for, for theology. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> Will not save you. <laughs> uh, scripture says the, uh, the, the Father works of himself through the Son and in the Holy Spirit. An example of that in uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things. So it's just using different prepositions. Uh, Athanasius and Basel said this threefold economy was, was indicated in, in Ephesians uh, 4 and, and verse 6. And, and you have uh, one spirit, you have one Lord, you have one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. So he is above all in himself, through all in the Son, and in you all in the Spirit. Uh, and again, uh, each of those would be uh, emphasis, not exclusion. Again, to the Father we say, well, he's the creator, the Son, the Redeemer, the Spirit. He's the sanctifier, but we've already seen passages where they're all involved in these things. For instance, John 17, 70, uh, Jesus praying to the Father, sanctify them uh, in your truth. Your word is truth. So the Father is the sanctifier there. Uh, economic Trinity. When we talk about economic Trinity, the manifestation of the Trinity in the outside, out, outside the essence of God. This is the economic Trinity as the Trinity is at work outside of itself, producing things outside the Trinity. This reflects the imminent relations. The imminent Trinity is reflected by the uh, economic Trinity. Uh, and there are various examples of this. And, and generally in the history of Trinitarianism, uh, several have been... Uh, focused on, especially as revealing something about the uh, interrelationships of the three in the eternal community of the Trinity. And one is the incarnation. Incarnation, Christ is born, and that they would say, well, this is, this is the Father uh, uh, initiating this incarnation, uh, and uh, as the Son is incarnated, in the womb of Mary, and so they say generation uh, is reflected, the eternal father-son relationship, etern the eternal establishment of that is reflected in an in-time uh, creation of, of the, uh, the person of the uh, God-man in the womb of Mary. Um, aspiration or procession is reflected in the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost. Now, uh, uh, the other day, we had in one of my uh, uh, THM seminars, had a paper in which a good question was asked. Well, if, if that's true, why don't we appeal to other acts of the Spirit? Like when the Spirit comes upon Jesus at his baptism, uh, why do we go to this act when we talk about procession? paper was on the filioque and, and uh, interacting with what the filioque was all about. But, um, and I would say probably because in the church down through the years, uh, theologians have focused on these because these are epic uh, changing events uh, of the Spirit coming in and 
or, or either of the, of the second person or the third person coming into the world to create a new situation in the world. So with the incarnation, we have the second person taking on human flesh, and now there's a whole new situation in the world with God having become a man and now living in the world. And at Pentecost, you have the Holy Spirit coming in, forming the church, and now there's a new epic of the Spirit. In fact, several of the fathers said uh, that you had the Old Testament was dispensation of the Father, and then Christ came, and that was dispensation of the Son, and now we're in the dispensation of the Spirit. So there were some church fathers who said that. But they always focus on these epic-changing events as reflecting the, in a, in a, in a really significant way, the uh, inner workings or the inner relationships of the three. Again, economic trinity, this term again, is uh, the trinity is revealed in divine acts in history. Now, this is an ancient uh, representation of the Trinity, and no, no physical representation uh, is, is a, uh, you know, a really helpful because, in the end, because it's finite. Uh, and but, and, and it, it has them too far apart from each other. Uh, you don't have perichoresis in this, uh, but I guess you could say, because each one has, the, 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 the great triangle in the middle is the essence of the Trinity, and they, uh, they all have that entire essence. And so they're not appendages, but this looks like appendages. But anyhow, this is, this is an ancient thing, and uh, even though they didn't have colors in the ancient days like this, so, but anyhow. You'll see some of that sometimes in drawings. Uh, yeah, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jonathan. Question about the, um, the sequence of uh, economic uh, epoch changing events that uh -huh. the Trinity uh, were involved in through history. None of that sequence can really be uh, implied in the ontological in no. reality no. of the Trinity. No, because uh, th these, are, these are events in time. These are events in time, and and so what, what the principle that has been observed by various theologians about economic trinity revealing the imminent trinity is is that uh, what God does in time, and what the three persons do uh, amongst themselves in time, is reflects in some way, in a limited way, what. What they uh, what their relationship is in in eternity, uh, their eternal relationship, and the the eternal establishment of that relationship. So yeah, question. There was a question back there. Are we just raptured? No. <laughs> All right. All right, as I said, uh, lessons 33 and the, the, the two addenda for 33, I leave to you uh, uh, for your own uh, edification. Don't read them to your wife, okay? Yeah. Uh, let's see why. Uh, it, they, they, they're, they're just about all the, uh, as one of my professors, my seminary professors used to say, every ichasm and spasm uh, uh, that are, that has denied the Trinity uh, uh, since the reformers uh, uh, did such wonderful work with the, in 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 their comments on the Trinity. Well, what you had an Enlightenment, and the, the Enlightenment's child is uh, Protestant religious liberalism, and uh, their their and then uh, their ill uh, their uh, their uh, uh, <clears throat> a, a, rep, a disreputable offspring, the orthodoxy, and and all the other ichasms and spasms uh, resulting from these these uh, movements. Uh, uh, but that's what you have, and and uh, various denials of the Trinity. Uh, and so we're not surprised people uh, deny the Trinity uh, that they, they, they're not uh, Bible believers. Uh, they don't start their concept of God from, from God's word given to us. 
and build from God's word outward uh, to, to God. They don't do that. They rather start from their own uh, little pea brains and, and, and uh, anything that uh, believe anything as long as you don't believe anything uh, about the, the Bible being true or from God. So um, you consider the source, consider the source, consider where they studied, what, who, you know, what they hold concerning the word of God. Uh, if, they, if they don't believe the, word of God, the Bible is the word of God, you're wasting your time. You're, you're talking past them. You don't have the same epistemology. You're talking past each other epistemologically. You're not talking from the same, same, uh, con, uh, from the same uh, uh, epistemological foundation. You don't have the same concept of knowledge and the assurance of knowledge. You don't have anything like that. And so it's going to be ultimately frustration. And... Uh, um, what you can do is, is forbid them to say anything is right and wrong uh, because that, that's based on absolute truth. And that's ultimately based on a, uh, uh, on a God who is absolute truth. And, and so they cannot say that. They're not allowed to say that. Uh, and if they do, they're poaching. Uh, they're poaching on our territory. And so you say, please don't say right and wrong. Don't say you, that, that you think my, my thoughts are right or wrong uh, unless you agree that there is an ultimate right and wrong and that we have access to that right and wrong you know, from the one who is, that, is the source of, of truth. And you know, when, 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 you, when you are willing to admit that, then we can talk together. And we can talk together. Uh, we're going to talk about God's decree. When, when you'll hear that thrown around theology books, uh, you won't see that per se in the Bible, but you'll see it thrown around. It's a theological synthesis of a lot of biblical revelation. Uh, and the, um, the, the, the definition that I'm really interested in is the working definition, at least the one I'll hold you responsible for. The Westminster Confession uh, goes at lengths to exonerate God of being the author of sin uh, and uh, uh, robbing creatures of their freedom. Uh, and so they, there is a concept of freedom in the Westminster Confession that, that God does not uh, take away by his decree. But this is the working definition I want you to remember. This is God's eternal plan, whereby according to his decree of will and for his glory, he foreordained everything that occurs, everything that occurs. And we talked about this under, under uh, when we talked about God's perfection of will, will. We talked about his decretive will. We talked in his decretive will, there is uh, direct causation and also what? What else? Permission, permission. Uh, and that doesn't mean condoning. Permission does not mean condoning. It means, you know, if you really want to be that stupid, okay, go ahead. Um, and so sometimes God treats us that way. All right, biblical terms. We see a lot of terms uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Eitzah for counsel and advice, and uh, sod, uh, sod for, for counsel and uh, zamam uh, to consider or purpose or divide. There's a lot of terms in the Old Testament, different terms for for uh, purpose and having pleasure in and goodwill, ratzon for goodwill or favor, um, and, and things that are important in a culture uh, cause that culture to develop a lot of terms to deal with that. So you have a lot of a lot of synonyms and. Uh, and then in, in Greek, you have boule, which uh, you look in New Testament, has the concept of de determined, deliberative purpose. Selema is another term for will. Uh, doesn't uh, seem to always be used for this uh, determined purpose. Uh, eudokia, good pleasure. And praridzo for uh, predetermining or predestining or foreordaining. Prostasso to order beforehand to 
to prescribe or command or order. Uh, uh to uh, to prepare beforehand. Hatoimadzo is to prepare, is to prepare beforehand, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And then there's a prothesis. It's like a, uh, the purpose, uh, pur- purpose, kind of, kind of a thesis beforehand. Thesis, uh, we talk about a thesis. That's where you're, you're putting something. It's a proposition. You're, you're stating something. It's a standing, standing before, you know. So this is the purpose. And the prognosis, we talked about prognosis, the foreknowledge of God.